And I'm here to talk to you about production in the firm. So it's kind of a topic and a half. We'll talk about production. From that, we'll derive the theory of the firm. And I'm going to begin with a radical proposal. That which is going to be consumed must first be produced. So if you're going to consume anything, you first have to produce it. If I'm going to consume this glass of water, it must first be produced in some way. So the water has to be made drinkable. The glass has to be, the plastic, has to somehow be produced and delivered to, Mises, uh, the, to the Mises Institute and all sorts of other wonderful things. So if we're going to consume anything, it first has to be produced. So we, so we begin with a couple of very simple principles in the context of a very simple example in order to develop a few things. We're going to develop the theory of capital, the theory of value, the theory of exchange, the theory of money, and finally we'll talk a bit about the theory of the firm. Okay, so Guido showed you guys a couple of maps the other night. I uh, showed you a map of Austria, a map of Europe. This is a map of the island from the TV show Lost. Okay? So we have, so, so we might have someone who is lost on a desert island. Let's call that person Hurley. Okay? So we have someone who is lost on a desert island. Hurley is our hero who is lost on a, de on a, a desert island. And if Hurley is going to avoid death, as a guy who's lost on this desert island, he somehow needs to come up with sufficient calories, sufficient micronutrients, and sufficient shelter to basically, to basically take care of his person. Okay, so let's consider the production of food for just a second. So Hurley's not really going to be so good at catching fish, we'll say. Okay? Hurley, not, not much of a fisherman, but he can pick two mangoes a day. Okay? He goes on for a little bit and finally decides, you know, if he had a net, he could catch a fish every so often. And in order to produce this net, which would be, in the Mingarian sense, a higher order good, a capital good, as it were, he's going to have to save enough mangoes to sustain him while he's producing the net. So what is capital accumulation, and what does it do? Capital accumulation, fundamentally, is the process of lengthening the structure of production. It's counterintuitive at first, because we often think about capital being something that saves time. You know, you don't buy capital goods because it'll take, it'll, uh, take you longer to do something. You don't buy a lawnmower based on whether that lawnmower will make it will make mowing the lawn take longer. When we talk about lengthening the structure of production, we mean lengthening the period of time from the commencement of a production process to the consumption of the final output. Okay, so if Hurley's just picking mangoes, he's living he's living pretty much literally hand to mouth. He's climbing up, he's picking a mango, he's eating it. That's a relatively short structure of production. That's a relatively short production process. If he produces a net or if he produces a capital good, he has, to, he has to lengthen the structure of production, he has to take time, and he has to save resources to sustain him through the production of the capital good. He has to lengthen the structure of production. <clears throat> okay? He discovers that if he fashions a net, he can actually catch a fish. He can catch maybe one fish a day. He couldn't do that with his bare hands, but with a net, Hurley can catch one fish per day. He'll need to save in order to nourish himself through this production process. And eventually he gets to the point where he can catch one fish or he can produce two mangoes in a day. Either or. He can catch a fish or he can pick two mangoes. He's probably not going to be very long for, the, long for this world under those circumstances unless he accumulates additional capital. But we'll leave that as another discussion for another day. Okay, That's, in a nutshell, the theory of capital or part of the theory of capital. Okay, Now let's consider value. Notice the direction in which value is moving here. Okay? Value is not moving from the capital good to the output. Value is not moving from the cost of production to the value of the output. The sweat that Hurley's putting into the production of the net does not produce the value of the net. Rather, the value of the net is imputed backward from the value of the fish. Okay, so the value of the fish is what gives the net value. It's what gives Hurley value. It's what gives Hurley's time value, and his willingness to wait is what gives, is what would create, um, as uh, Professor Murphy mentioned yesterday, that's what would create interest. Um, his, his, his willingness to wait to delay consumption would create interest um, in a well-functioning economy. This is important. It's important for a lot of different reasons, because when people think of value. Uh, in most discussions, they don't think of, they don't think of it in, in these terms. They think about the physical and chemical characteristics of whatever it is that's being discussed. Or they think about labor as being a source of value. If you study Karl Marx, or if you study 19th century socialism, 
labor was, was, was taken as, as sort of the theory of value. But then, of course, that begged the question, well, where does labor get its value? And we know that in a market economy, in this situation, value is imputed backward from final consumption to the capital goods that go into that production process. Okay. That's value. Let's talk about trade. Someone else shows up. Hurley goes on his merry way, and then he discovers that someone else is washed up on the island. Okay, Jin is a proficient fisherman and a proficient mango picker. Jin can catch six fish or pick three mangoes in a day. That's going to give Hurley and Jin production possibilities. Okay, Hurley, Hurley can catch one fish or pick two mangoes in a day. Jin can catch six fish or pick three mangoes in a day. And what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're, we're going to, we're going to develop a theory of exchange based on these differences in productivity. Okay? Given Hurley's production possibilities, the opportunity cost to Hurley of catching a fish is the two mangoes he could have picked otherwise. So, in order to catch a fish, he gives up the opportunity to pick two mangoes. Gita Holzman talked about this, uh, about this yesterday. In order to pick one mango, he gives up the opportunity to catch half a fish. Okay, that might might seem somewhat unrealistic, but maybe he sets out the net one day and then the fish appears the next, or, so, or so, something to that effect. Okay, for Jin, every fish he catches, for every fish he catches, he gives up the opportunity to uh, pick half a mango. For every mango he picks, he gives up the opportunity to catch two fish. Okay, all right. So opportunity cost it shows us some differences in productivity, and now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to determine whether they can, in fact, actually gain from exchange. Okay? So at first glance, it appears that Hurley doesn't really bring a whole lot to the table. Jim is a fish-catching and mango-picking superstar. Okay? So what in the world could Jim, the fish-catching, mango-picking superstar uber stud, possibly have to gain from dealing with Hurley? Is he going to come in when, he, when, uh, when Hurley sees him? Is he going to come in and take all of Hurley's jobs, so to speak? Is he going to absorb all of the, all of the labor that Hurley could, in fact, be doing? Okay, well, not necessarily, because the law of comparative advantage is not determined necessarily by who's the biggest stud at fish catching and who's the biggest stud at mango picking, but who has the lowest opportunity cost. Hurley, in this case, has a lower opportunity cost for mango picking than does Jin. Jin, on the other hand, has a lower opportunity cost for fishing than does Hurley. Jin has a comparative advantage in fish. He only gives up half a mango for each fish, while Hurley would have to give up two mangoes for every fish. For Hurley, fishing is relatively costly. He gives up two mangoes for every fish that he catches, and for Jen, on the other hand, picking mangoes is costly, because he gives up two fish for every mango that he picks. So suppose that one morning, you know, they, ex they exchange pleasantries, and they're both sort of doing their own thing. They're operating in what we call autarky, which means they're not cooperating, they're not trading. Hurley offers Jen a mango in exchange for a fish. Is this a good deal or not? Well, let's consider. Okay? If Hurley catches a fish, it costs him the opportunity to pick two mangoes. Okay? If he can get a fish by only giving up one mango through trade, he's better off. Okay? Each, fish is each fish is cheaper for Hurley if he's able to get them through trade. Instead of having to do without mangoes if he wants to eat fish, he can pick two mangoes, trade one of them for a fish, and he can have a mango and a fish. Okay, so fish are cheaper for Hurley if he's able to get them through trade. Therefore, this is a really good deal for Hurley. Okay, but of course, naturally, if Hurley uh, if Hurley's better off, then Jin has to lose, right? Well, not necessarily. Okay, so let's let's look at this let's look at this from Jin's perspective. Okay, for every mango that Jin picks himself, he would have to give up the opportunity to catch two fish. Okay, so therefore, if he can get a mango by only giving up one fish. Through trade, then he's clearly better off. So this is also going to be a good deal for Jin. Okay, so if they can agree to a mango price of fish that's between their opportunity costs, they can both make themselves better off. Okay, so an exchange economy has here been born by the addition of Jin to this economy and by the differences in their relative productivities. Okay, so Hurley should, spe should specialize relative to Jin in mango picking. Jin should specialize relative to Hurley in fish, they're both better off. It's a positive sum game. This is one of the fundamental principles of economics. Trade creates wealth. Okay? Trade creates wealth by allowing us to consume more than we would otherwise be able to get if we just did all of our own stuff ourselves. Okay? An exchange economy. 
has been born. Let's suppose that, okay, so we got Hurley's trading mangoes to gin in exchange for fish. Suppose a third person shows up. Sawyer washes ashore with several cases of peanut butter. Okay? Just for whatever reason, he shows up in a raft, he's got peanut butter, he, he looks swarthy. Okay? And he's got, he's got all this peanut butter, he's wondering sort of what to do with it. Hurley would really like peanut butter. Yeah. Hurley likes peanut butter a lot. He'd like some peanut butter to go with his mangoes, some peanut butter to go with his fish, perhaps. Okay? He likes Thai food, maybe, you know, so something, something to that effect. Okay, so he exploits his comparative advantage and Hurley exploits his comparative advantage in mango production. Okay, and he shows up at Sawyer's tent. And he says, hey, you know, Sawyer, I've got some mangoes. I'll trade you for this peanut butter. Sawyer responds, okay, yeah, sorry, I'm allergic to mangoes. Okay, so Sawyer's allergic to mangoes. Hurley wants Sawyer's peanut butter. Perhaps we've reached an impasse. We have, we have the problem of the mutual coincidence of wants that we have to somehow try to solve. Okay, and one way that we can get around this is, you know, perhaps Hurley says, well, okay, I've got these mangoes that Sawyer doesn't want in exchange for peanut butter, but maybe what I can do is I can take some of the fish that I've been getting from Jen, and I can trade that to Sawyer in exchange for peanut butter. So he says, okay, Sawyer, how about fish? Sawyer says, oh, yeah, great, fish, fish are wonderful. I'll trade you some peanut butter in exchange for fish. And we have the development now of a monetary economy. Okay. The development of a monetary economy in which fish are now serving the role of money. Because fish are taking not only their, not only a value in consumption, they're also taking value in exchange. Okay. Hurley wants fish not just because he likes fish, but he wants fish because he can use them to trade for peanut butter. Okay. I'll refer you to your notes on the money and banking lecture, uh, for reasons why fish will probably not emerge in long run equilibrium as the monetary commodity. <laughs> Okay, and if you're in one of my sessions during the uh, uh, during the exam at the end of the week, that's probably something that will be asked. Okay, all right. I'll just tell you now: if you can't explain why fish wouldn't be a very good money, then uh, then your, your your chance of passing the exam may not be so great. All right. Okay, so we've got value, we've got money, we've got capital, we've got exchange. Another thing that that, that tends to emerge as societies get more and more complex is they organize themselves into hierarchies. Okay, so the emergence of hierarchy is one of history's ultimate regularities. And hierarchy can take two forms. Hierarchy can be voluntary, or hierarchy can be involuntary. A voluntary hierarchy is a firm. Okay, so a firm is, some people define it as a nexus of contracts, whereby people come together and engage in some production process via voluntary mechanisms. An involuntary hierarchy is a state. Okay? A state is where someone with a comparative advantage in violence comes along <laughs> and says, that's a technical term. Incidentally, I worked with, uh, I worked with Douglas North at Wash U, and I, I teach his book when I teach economic history, and he defines a state as an organization with a comparative advantage in violence extending over a geographic area with boundaries that are determined by its powers to tax constituents. Okay? Which basically means a state has a comparative advantage in violence, and they're the guys who can stick a knife in your gut if you don't pay up. When they come around asking for taxes, okay. All right, so we'll leave. So we'll leave, the, we'll leave the analysis of involuntary hierarchies over the course of the uh, over the course of the rest of the week, and we'll talk about the economics of voluntary hierarchy um, over the next uh, the next little bit. Okay. So voluntary hierarchy poses an interesting problem. Why do we have firms? The theory of the firm tries to explain a couple of things. It tries to explain why firms exist, what determines firm boundaries and how and why firms organize themselves internally. It's not immediately apparent from some of the principles we've developed that complex activity should result in the organization of individuals and the organization of actions into firms. I believe it was Dennis, Dennis Robertson, I think, who said that um, like lumps of butter coagulating on the top of milk, you know, people... Economists were much more colorful in the 20s and 30s than, 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 they, than they are today. You know, today we define... Uh, a firm is, you know, a production vector such that conditions A, B, C, and D are fulfilled. And if condition D prime does, uh, isn't, uh, isn't filled, then we need antitrust or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So it's not immediately apparent why firms organize themselves into, or excuse me, why people organize themselves into firms, why they organize themselves into voluntary hierarchies. Why in the, this massive array of human action that emerges in a complex society, why we get Apple? 
because, well, there are a handful of, uh, handful of, uh, of explanations. One is comparative advantage or opportunity cost, okay? Or economies of scale. All of the, these different, these different uh, explanations saying, well, people can take advantage of economies of scale or specialization or whatever if they organize themselves into firms, but that's not necessarily the case, okay? Because people can contract. You know, if I want, if I want something done for me, I can just pay someone to do it. Okay, it's not immediately clear to me, it's not immediately clear to anyone really, that we need to organize ourselves into a hierarchy whereby you agree to take orders from me, okay, and whereby I agree to pay you to take those orders. Okay? Eventually someone kind of hit on something, and this is the explanation to which I am uh, uh, most sympathetic. Ronald Coase, um, a name that you might have heard, and a name that you'll probably hear, that you should hear if you study economics, he asked, if markets are so great, why is it that we organize ourselves into these tiny little socialist organizations or these tiny little socialist economies? Okay, because when you get down to it, like we said, trade creates wealth, prices reveal information, okay? prices allow for rational economic calculation. So what a firm is, is basically, is basically people getting together and voluntarily deciding to forsake market exchange in order to organize production. Okay? So they're saying we're going to forego Trade in the market, you're going to agree to take orders from me, I'm going to agree to give orders to you, okay? We're not actually going to trade, so we're going to forsake this information revealing mechanism. Coase says, well, if markets are so great, why is it that people actually do this? Okay, his answer was the cost of transacting. Transaction costs, okay, according to, according to Coase, are the reason why we have firms. Reason for this, okay, is because contracting is itself costly. Okay, you can't just go out and say, "Okay, I need this. All right, I need something done. I need something typed. I need something written. I need something designed. I need a PowerPoint presentation done. I need a lecture given, and have someone instantaneously come to you and say, I will do it.' Okay, contracting is itself costly. Okay, Coase's explanation is the explanation again to which I'm most sympathetic. Hierarchy, voluntary hierarchy, can economize on the cost of using the marketplace. Okay, these costs are the cost of transacting. They're the cost of measuring the valuable attributes of goods and services. Okay, and they're, and they're the cost of specifying and enforcing contracts. The organization of a firm allows you to reduce the costs that will be associated with continuous contracting to get done the things that you want done, to exploit economies of scale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of these wonderful other reasons for why we think we have firms. Okay. So it's less costly to organize a firm than it would be to do everything through the marketplace, than it would be to, than it would be to do everything through exchange. So what are the limits to firm size? We know that firms forsake the market because they can economize on the cost of trade, they can economize on the cost of, of the exchange process. We want to know now, well, what, what, is it, what is it that determines how big firms get? The explanation for why we have firms, the cost of transacting, also shows us those firms' limitations, or it shows us the limitations on the size of the firm, and it shows us the limitations on the decisions that the firms will ultimately make. One of the really interesting things about academia is you can, you can build a, a fairly nice career by studying one company. Okay? And for me, in the last couple of years, that one company has been Walmart. I do a lot of research on the economic history of the South, and I've also done a lot of research on Walmart. So let's, let's talk a little bit about Walmart. Okay? Walmart is uh, referred to by some as the beast from Bentonville. It's the destroyer of small towns. Okay? We'll evaluate all of that later. Walmart does one thing very, very, very well. They move goods from point A to point B, from one side of the world to the other, at rock-bottom cost. They deliver everyday low prices. They deliver stuff very, very cheaply to wherever it is you want to be. I bought some T-shirts at Walmart this morning, a pack of five T-shirts for eight bucks. Five cotton t-shirts for eight dollars. If I tried to produce a cotton t-shirt myself, I guarantee you it would be of much lower quality, and most certainly each individual shirt would probably cost more than eight dollars. A bit of digression here on this. So my wife and I grow tomatoes every so often. We live in Memphis and uh, relatively reasonable uh, tomato tomato growing climate. Um, a couple of years ago, I calculated that we're probably coming in at about thirty bucks a tomato in terms of in terms of the, in terms of our opportunity cost, in terms of the cost that we're incurring in order to produce those tomatoes, but they taste a whole lot better 
than the stuff you get at the store. And they'd bloody well better taste a whole lot better than what you can get at the store if we're devoting $30 worth of resources per tomato to their production. Okay. So Walmart manages a global supply chain that moves goods and information around the world with almost unparalleled efficiency. They have a satellite in geosynchronous orbit um, around Bentonville, Arkansas, such that they know what's going where, when it's going, and they have probably the best... Um, the best data collection technology, the best set of retail data that has ever been assembled. It's only half the story, though. The suits in Bentonville, Arkansas, cannot have the local knowledge that they would need in order to micromanage the daily operations of the Super Walmart in New Haven, Connecticut, that my wife and I stopped at a couple of days ago. Okay, so I was collecting some data on Walmart, collecting some data on Sam's Club, and I noticed there are some things at the Super Walmart in New Haven, Connecticut, that we don't have at our Super Walmart in Memphis, and some things that we have at our Super Walmart in Memphis that they don't have in New Haven, Connecticut. Okay, And if you're some guy in an office in Bentonville, Arkansas, odds are you don't know necessarily what local market conditions are always going to be like in New Haven, Connecticut, or in Los Angeles, California, or in any of the other places where Walmart does business. Okay? Walmart gives their managers and associates relatively wide latitude with respect to product, place, promotion, and price. So if you've ever taken a marketing class, you've probably heard, the, heard those four terms. You can decide what's on special at, at times. You have, a, you have a lot of latitude over um, the placement of your products, and then corporate, quote-unquote, does really, really well at just moving product. It basically just moving products around. Okay? Walmart has been less successful in some other places because, they, because their ability to exploit local knowledge within the firm is and can be extremely limited. So particularly as they've expanded overseas, they've run into a lot of trouble. C.K. Prahalad has a really great book called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, okay, where he talks about ingenuity among the world's global poor, preferences among the world's global poor, and how firms in developing countries are able to succeed where companies like Walmart and others have failed because they have access to local knowledge that these firms uh, that these big multinationals can't quite ex, uh, qu can't quite exploit. Okay, so some of Walmart's overseas operations consist of joint partnerships with firms that have local knowledge but not Walmart's logistics expertise. So, a question I ask my Econ 101 students: When will Walmart take over the world? Okay, what do you think? Never. never. Okay. All right, so we have an answer of never for for when Walmart will take over the world. When will the world be run by one giant firm? Okay? Because they can constantly exploit economies of scale. They can keep producing. Walmart will say can keep driving out little competitors by driving down cost and driving down cost and driving down cost. And then eventually Walmart is going to be the only company. Okay? What's wrong with that story? Ah, okay, so you can, you, can make, you can make a lot of money by just setting up stores and having Walmart buy you out. Okay? There's an episode of The Simpsons um, that speaks to that in the context of Microsoft. Okay? It involves Bill Gates showing up with a couple of thugs to trash... Uh, uh, trash Homer Simpson's home office. Okay, <laughs> look for it on YouTube. All right. Okay, so that's that's one that's one problem with the story. Well, let's consider. So we have Walmart, kind of up here. It's this little tiny company in Bentonville, Arkansas, um, in the 1960s, and they do some things very very well. Very very low prices, so they grow. Walmart gets bigger, and they earn even more profits. There's an online map uh, you should check out. Someone. Uh, he's a graduate student somewhere. I cannot for the life of me remember his name. But he has a, he has a, uh, a map that shows the growth of Walmart over time. It's really, it's, it's really quite impressive. Okay? But Walmart gets bigger. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And they keep growing. They're, they're profitable. They're wonderful. You know, they're earning profits and they're making money and they're growing. And see, so, you know, Sam Walton's on the cover of Fortune or something like that. And they keep getting bigger. And well, one thing that we notice here is that as they get bigger, the resolution on the, on the logo picture here is starting to get a little bit grainier and a little bit grainier. Why is that? Because they're trading off the efficiencies that they're getting from larger scale for an increased knowledge problem. So let's think about that for a second. As a firm grows, it economizes on the cost of contracting in the marketplace. Okay, so these are external transaction costs. But this increases the cost that the firm will incur because their ability to engage in rational economic calculation is limited by the fact that there are no prices for goods that are not traded in markets. These are internal transaction costs. Firms that do a lot of things in-house can use the prices generated by the market to calculate, 
But in the limit, this problem gets worse and worse as the firm gets bigger and bigger. Okay, so you know that quote unquote unskilled labor is traded in a relatively competitive market. Okay, so you can observe market prices for unskilled labor. You can observe market prices for trucks. You can observe market prices for tires. You can observe market prices for computers, for paper, and things like this. So this allows you to calculate to a certain degree, but as a firm gets bigger and as it brings more and more production in-house, as it brings more and more of the firm's operations inside the firm, okay, then it faces an, incre an ever-increasing knowledge problem. Okay. So eventually, the, the world will never be run by one giant firm because, again, as we notice, we get bigger, the resolution decreases, the decisions that they're making get fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier, Okay? And eventually the company just gets, just gets too unwieldy. The reason why the world will never be run by one giant firm is because it will run into exactly the same problem that a socialist government runs into. Prices are necessary for rational economic calculation. And if there is no market for your inputs and no market for your outputs, there can be no prices. Therefore, there can be no rational economic calculation. Okay? So if Walmart is the only firm... If they're the only seller of output, the only buyer of labor, the only buyer of capital, they have no way to value the inputs, no way to engage in rational economic calculation, and no way to know whether they're using resources effectively. How many of you have seen Wally? Right, so a lot of people have seen Wally. Okay. There's a firm in uh, there's a firm in Wally called By and Large, okay, which I think is a, is a very it's a very clever name, By and Large. Okay. It's a sort of a sort of a send up, I think, of Walmart, and it shows kind of the the anti capitalist nightmare that eventually, you know, Walmart or by and large gets so big that they effectively run the show. The problem, and this bugged me all all through uh, the whole time while I was sitting through Wally, is well, you've got this one firm problem, you've got this socialist economy problem. How does by and large engage in rational economic calculation? Okay, <laughs> this is why I'm a lot of fun at parties. Okay. <laughs> Is because I ask questions like this. Okay? I also do weddings and bar mitzvahs. Okay? <laughs> right. So let's consider how is it that a firm decides how big to get? Okay? How do firms decide how big to get? How do firms decide whether they've chosen wisely or not? How does a firm know whether it's using resources economically, or how does a firm know that it's wasting resources? What tells them whether they're making good decisions? A priori, we can form expectations, but we can't know whether a firm is creating value. We cannot know whether a production process is going to create value a priori. A posteriori, after the fact, profits and losses tell us whether we're choosing wisely. When we earn profits, we're using resources to produce outputs that better satisfy other people's wants and needs than they would in other lines of employment. Okay? When we're earning losses... We're using resources to produce outputs that are less valuable than the resources would be in other lines of employment. In a well-functioning market economy, resource-wasting firms will get slapped around by the invisible hand, and the losses they earn will tell them that their skills are better used elsewhere. So let's consider an example. Imagine if we will. So I've been walking around Auburn for a couple of days, and I've noticed there, there's, a, there's a, a niche, I think, that can be filled. There's a hole in the marketplace in Auburn. That hole is for sour cream, sauerkraut, and salmon smoothies. I've noticed no one in Auburn is selling sour cream, sauerkraut, and salmon smoothies. I think it can be done. Now, what would you expect to happen if I were to open a store and say, hey, you know, Cardin sour cream, sauerkraut, and salmon smoothies? Mmm, appetizing. All right. What's that? <laughs> Someone would try one. Okay. <laughs> That's got bar bet written all over it. <laughs> all right. Okay, so we would guess, and then most people would probably infer, that if I'm using sour, uh, sour cream, sauerkraut, and salmon to produce smoothies, this is probably going to earn losses. Okay, people are not going to buy these. Or they might try them. Or again, like I said, they might do it on a dare. Or something to that effect. But the market signal from these losses is going to be, hey, doofus. <laughs> You're using the sauerkraut, you're using the sour cream, you're using the, you're using the salmon to produce these smoothies that no one wants, that no one wants to buy. This is all more valuable elsewhere. You should put the sour cream, um, on a potato. Or something like that. It's more valuable in, in, in that, uh, employment. The sauerkraut is more valuable on bratwurst. 
The salmon is more valuable than anything other than a smoothie. Okay? <laughs> so, the market, pro- the, the well-functioning market process will tell us that, hey, you need to go do something else. Okay? Not produce smoothies. Not be an entrepreneur. Okay? Quit wasting our valuable resources. And that's the built-in mechanism that tells firms that they are uh, using resources wisely or perhaps using resources poorly. Fortunately, as we've been told recently, uh, all the firms that have received bailout money, GM and Chrysler uh, included, we can, we, can, we can rest comfortably in knowing that no political considerations will go into any of the decisions that they make, okay? and that they will respond as if they're responding to the profit-maximizing um, considerations that they, that they would have as entrepreneurs. Okay, now let's suppose that I'm producing something that people really, really like, that people really like a lot. I'm producing pizza. People like pizza. Yeah, yeah, pizza's good. Um, barbecue pizza, something we eat in Memphis. Barbecue nachos we eat in Memphis. I didn't know until I moved to Memphis that uh, someone made barbecue nachos. Okay, These things are amazing. <laughs> great taste that tastes great together. Now, one would observe a firm producing barbecue nachos or barbecue pizza and observe this firm earning profits, in the long run, this is going to attract entry and all profitable opportunities are going to get competed away. Okay, So the market is going to send the signals that tell people what to produce, how to produce it, where to produce it, when to produce it, and the manner in which they can produce it that will create the most value for society. Okay, Profits attract entry in the very long run. All factors of production will earn the discounted present value of their marginal revenue product. Okay. Discounted present value of their marginal revenue product. Okay, say that ten times fast. Okay, which basically means that you'll be paid according to what you can produce. Capitalists will earn interest that reward them for foregone consumption, and in the long run, we will have no economic profits. Okay, so the market has built-in mechanisms that tell firms and individuals whether they're using resources wisely, whether they're using resources poorly. And in the long run, resources will be used in a way that produces the most value possible. Okay. So let's close with a couple of thoughts on firm boundaries, the extent of the market, and the relationship between regulation and the knowledge problem. The knowledge problem. So uh, Joseph Salerno gave you a lecture earlier today on the, on the uh, socialist calculation debate. This, I think, so Mises' contribution to the socialist calculation debate, and then Hayek's 1945 paper on the use of knowledge in society, I think sort of looking into the very, very long run, I think and I hope that these may be, these may be viewed for the 21st century as two of the most fundamental contributions to economic science that have ever been made. Because they force people to ask a very, very, very important question. How do you know? Okay? And the short answer is that in the absence of private property, in the absence of a, well function, of a well-functioning price mechanism, generally, we don't. Okay, so presumably, we have government regulation in order to prevent concentration in certain markets, but we want to ask, well, what are the relevant markets? A couple of years ago, Pete Betke and Peter Leeson wrote an article in which they, on uh, the transition out of socialism, in which they asked, is the transition to the market too important to be left to the market? Okay. In the same spirit, I will ask, is the definition of the market too important to be left to the market? So can the market decide what the boundaries of the market actually, actually are? Unsurprisingly, I would answer yes. Okay. Why? Because the market process itself reveals the information that will be necessary for the regulators to regulate rationally. Regulation, intervention, subverts the market process and in many cases destroys the very information that would be needed for well-functioning, well-meaning regulators to regulate in the first place. Okay, so it renders these types of decisions potentially arbitrary. As James Buchanan once argued, order is defined in the process of its emergence, and in the same way, markets are themselves defined in the process of their emergence. There are a couple of specific examples here. I read this morning that the anti- that antitrust authorities have their uh, their sights set on Google. So the antitrust authorities are going to go after Google. I've seen it suggested that antitrust authorities should go after Apple because they dominate the market for MP3 players. They dominate the market for iPhones and iPhone substitutes. And I've written a Mises article on a couple of summers ago, the debate over whether Whole Foods Market and Wild Oats Market should be allowed to merge. Okay? They've tr- attracted scrutiny from federal regulators because they control, control, Disproportionate shares of certain markets. Now, why would I put control 
in scare quotes. Okay. Okay, well, it's not true. Okay, yeah, so, so I might put it in scare quotes because it's not necessarily true. If, you, if you're going to control someone, then presumably you have the power to direct their actions, to direct them to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. Okay, Whole Foods Market does not control me because I live two blocks from Kroger. They can't come to my house with guns and say, thou shalt go and shop at Whole Foods Market. Okay, Google does not control me because I can use Yahoo. I can use Bing. Apple does not control me because I can use fine products from uh, Microsoft and <laughs> other firms. <laughs> I, made, I made the Mac switch last summer. We can, we can talk about that later. Okay. All right. So these are markets. One of the things that, that interests me about these cases against Google, Apple, and Whole Foods Market is the markets are talking about are markets for stuff that didn't exist not that long ago. Uh, I just turned 30 in March. And I noticed that you know my, my 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 students who come in 18, 19 years old, they have they've had access to things like I didn't have till graduate school. I didn't get my first cell phone until my first year of graduate school. I didn't get my first laptop until my third year of graduate school, and so on and so forth. My first vehicle was a Brontosaurus. You know, it's just it's you know they have all of this great stuff that didn't exist many many moons ago back when uh, when when I when I was in that uh, in that situation. Okay, so when the Whole Foods and Wild when the Whole Foods and Wild Oats market merger was being scrutinized, the authorities, the Federal Trade Commission, claimed that this would create undue market power in the market for, and I quote, premium natural and organic supermarkets. End quote. So I did what any good economist would do. I said, Well, what exactly are premium natural and organic supermarkets? Let's go to the North American Industrial Classification System, which is how we define firm boundaries and see what is the four firm concentration ratio or the eight firm concentration ratio in the quote premium natural and organic supermarkets end quote uh, NAICS classification. Okay, I couldn't find such a category in the sort of standard standard data set by which we classify which industries are which. Okay, so literally the case against this merger was supported by claims that we're just making stuff up. Okay, so the federal so the Federal Trade Commission is saying we're going to just make up an industrial category and claim that it's going to be controlled by this entity that is Whole Foods Market or Whole Paycheck Market, as some people have uh, as some people have called it. Okay, and we'll cook up some rationale for uh, for regulation, some rationale for intervention, some reason why we should be able to stop this merger. Okay, so we have a handful of simple principles: action choice, and scarcity. These give us a relatively simple theory of production, which in turn produces a theory of complex organization in a free society. Furthermore, it's a simple and obvious system of natural liberty. Simple and obvious system of natural liberty, a nice quote from our, our good friend Adam Smith, okay, that produces the knowledge people need in order to engage in rational economic calculation. So if we observe Whole Foods Market earning massive profits, in the natural and organic, organic premium supermarket, or excuse me, premium natural and organic supermarket sector, then what should we do? Well, we observe their profits, we go and we compete with them. We produce our own premium natural and organic foods. Our local Kroger does this. Okay? This gener their profits generate knowledge. The profits that Whole Foods Market are, the Whole Foods Market earns, the profits that Apple earns, the profits that Google earns says, hey, you are creating value. You are taking resources and you're turning them into something that people like more than they would if this stuff was used in some other way. Okay? This then is going to naturally draw firms into these markets. It's going to draw for it, it, it's, it's going to draw competitors, and furthermore, it's going to encourage innovation. So ultimately, attempts to regulate, attempts to define firm boundaries, and attempts to tell firms that they have too much market that they have too much market power are going to prove themselves redundant. Mark mentioned that some, several years ago, I was uh, I was in y'all's Y'all's position as a student here at Mises U. And I, I, I remember Mark, uh, I remember Tom DiLorenzo saying something that has stuck with me. And every time I've talked about the theory of the firm, I've brought this up. Okay, so we can say, so we can say, well, we, we, we want to determine how much market power there is in a given industry. Okay, and we can calculate a four firm concentration ratio, or we can calculate this, we can calculate price cost margins, we can calculate all of this stuff. Implicit in this, as Professor DiLorenzo mentions, is the assumption that the market was in long-run equilibrium on the day the data were collected. It might just so happen 
that the marketing question is in long-run equilibrium on the day that the data were collected. That's a rather heroic assumption about the way the market process operates and a rather heroic assumption about the array of knowledge that's available to the regulators. Okay. So the process itself generates the knowledge that tells us whether we're creating value or whether we are not. So apart from the information that is generated by the market process, we cannot know how firms, how firms should be organized. We cannot know how firms should be regulated. And we cannot know when firms are too big or too big to fail. So those are a couple of thoughts on production, on the firm, and on the market process. So I've got a couple of minutes. I'd be happy to take any questions and have a little bit of discussion. Okay, so, okay, so how, do I, how do I feel about, how do I feel about shirking costs? Okay, so, okay, so, so, how, so how do we, so how do I feel about the cost of shirking? So, so more generally the cost of monitoring. Okay. So this is, this might, this might be one, this might be one reason why firms exist. Okay. Like I mentioned, firms economize on internal transaction costs. And if you're going to, if you're going to contract with somebody, then it might be difficult to get them to actually fulfill their end of the bargain. So you say, all right, um, I'll pay you to mow my grass. Or rather, something, something, that, something that's usually, that's usually done inside firms. Um, I will pay you to make photocopies for me. And then you take my money and you just don't do it. Or I will pay you to do these spreadsheets. Or I will pay you to do these analyses. And then you either don't do it or, or, um, uh, or you do it rather poorly. What the firm can do is, is we, can, we, can, uh, we can contract into a hierarchy whereby you agree to take orders from me and whereby you agree to be monitored by me and I then evaluate your performance periodically. Okay, and then this, this, this then increases the cost to you of shirking and might reduce the cost to me of being taken, taken advantage of in, in a, uh, uh, in some type of bargain. So I would say that's consistent with the transaction, with the transaction cost view of the firm. Basically. Yeah. Okay. So could you, could you just structure the contract in such a way, uh, so, so that, so that you only pay after the, uh, um, after the bargain has been fulfilled? Yeah, you could. But in some cases, it might it might be costly to actually it might be costly actually to measure the output. Okay, so that might be that might be another reason. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So so question one: Could licensing create distortion? Okay. Um, yes. The the first the first way obviously is by creating um, by creating rents for the firms that are in the licensed industry, and by creating deadweight loss as a result of the fact that we don't get as much output as we otherwise would. Okay, now in terms of how that, how that distorts economic calculation, there are a couple of, a couple of things that are going on here. One thing that we've noticed, um, you might have seen that Walmart signed onto a letter saying, hey, we need to have this employer health care mandate. In 2005, Walmart said, hey, we need to increase the minimum wage. Um, a blogger and journalist for the New York Times had a post last week saying, hey, look at all these businesses that have signed, that have signed this petition saying, hey, we need to increase the minimum wage. Isn't this inconsistent with what we learn in Econ 101, because businesses should have some form of solidarity because they have class interest or something to that effect. Look at these people who are an exception to what Econ 101 would predict. Okay, I would argue this is in fact actually exactly what Econ 101 predicts in the face of political incentives, in the face of incentives to compete by trying to kneecap your competitors via the legislative process. So implications of that would be net distortion in economic calculation diversion of resources toward political competition, and actually larger firms. Okay, because if you increase the fixed cost of starting a firm, then this is going to make smaller, firm, smaller firms relatively less profitable, larger firms relatively more profitable. Okay, and second, second question. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understand. So, so how, are, how are they discriminating? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Ah, okay, yeah, that, yeah, that's that's uh, that's a that's an interesting it's an interesting question. So, so the so the idea is le is can legislation prevent firms from seeking cheaper suppliers? Can legislation prevent firms from going elsewhere when they're getting quote unquote gouged for their product? The short answer is yes. Uh, regulation regulation of distribution in the United States is very very interesting. Um, for example, you have to have you have to have certain licenses to be able to distribute products in uh, in some areas. So uh, again, Professor Di Lorenzo mentioned in his lecture earlier that I think in the 1970s there were something like 25 brands of beer in the U.S. Okay, and one of the reasons why there weren't more brands of beer in the U.S. 
in the 1970s was the way that liquor distribution um, was regulated. That actually that actually opens a, an interesting can of worms that uh, would provide a lot of great dissertation topics for people who are interested in the uh, studying economics at the graduate level. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so would regulation reduce self-employment? Um, a priori, I would say probably so. Just because because what because clearing the hurdles associated with getting all the licenses and things like that that you need um, in order to open your own firm would be so costly that a lot of people just say, okay, yeah, forget it. I'm going to go work for Walmart, or I'm going to go work for Target, or I'm going to or I'm going to go work for Mega Global Evil Corp, or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Reminds me of another uh, another another great book everybody should read is Hernando de Soto's book, um, The Mystery of Capital, why capitalism uh, uh, why capitalism succeeds in the West and quote fails everywhere else. Okay, uh, de Soto and a bunch of his re and, and members of his research team in Peru said, well let's uh, let let's see what let's see what it costs to open a firm to open a shirt factory in the United States uh, or a shirt factory in Canada and let's see what it would cost to open a shirt factory in Peru. Okay. So I'm just going to make up numbers here because I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But I think in the United States, it took a couple of days. You know, you get a few things signed, you pay a couple of fees, and so on and so forth. In Peru, it took years. Or I think it took years. might have taken 289 days or, or, or something like that. In some places, it did, in fact, take years, numerous, numerous signatures. And there were some situations in which, even though they said we're not going to pay bribes, they actually had to bribe people because otherwise, otherwise the entire process would stop. <laughs> Okay. This is so. This is this is one this is one reason why firms why firms in some places like that might tend to be much larger, and why a lot of economic activity in relatively poor countries takes place underground. Okay. Second point. Okay. Could it? Okay. So so could could foreclosing private could foreclosing private or uh, individual self employment result in lower wages? Again, a priori, I would say yes, because if you if you if you make the next bet the next best opportunity illegal, then that Probably that that gives you that might give you some market power in the labor market. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so could Walmart take over the world even if it were inefficient because smaller firms wouldn't be able to compete because they run into the same calculation problems? Okay, um, I would say one. Let me qualify the claim. So Walmart could take over the world if they hired an army, and you know. Ran roughshod over everybody. So yes, so there's po there's probably some conceivable world in which Walmart decides to become a coercive entity, which, given some of the recent activity, uh, may not be may not be too far fetched. Um, we're, we're, we're we're going to assume that they don't do that though. Um, the thing the pro the problem is that the knowledge problem, the degree to which the knowledge problem matters is a function is an increasing function of the firm's size. Okay, so so smaller firms are not going to run into the same kinds of knowledge problem, uh, the same kinds of knowledge problems that firms like that firms like Walmart will, will run into. And when we talk about whether firm A, firm B, firm C is going to take over the world, th this has kind of a boy that cried wolf uh, sort of feel to it because people have said this over and over and over again about all of these enormous firms that are going to take over the world. They're going to do whatever evil, terrible, horrible thing. So as much as people hate Walmart now, Don Boudreau at George Mason has what I think is an interesting hypothesis and one that I agree with. He thinks that someday Walmart is going to get put out of business. And almost certainly Walmart will be creatively destroyed. Okay? And people, you know, various commentators and whatnot will say, oh, look at the, the, the tragic death of this American institution that gave us, you know, all of this wonderful stuff that gave us one-stop shopping, that gave us, you know, this and that and the other thing. Oh, I remember, you know, the, the, the the essence of my childhood was going to Walmart, you know, and being able to go buy, you know, Little Debbie's and then just walk across the store and, and get, like, sporting goods and T-shirts with cute slogans on them, you know. We, we've lost a piece of Americana, okay, as much as, as, much as, people, hate, as, much as people hate Walmart today. Don Boudreaux thinks that that's what's eventually going to happen, and I, I would have to say I probably agree with him. So, two. Sorry, heavy what? Oh. Okay. Yes, definitely. Okay. So, do do does heavy regulation of the labor market have an effect on firm size? Okay. Again, I don't I don't I don't know what the data says, but I would expect I would expect to see exactly that. So, I'd say one thing one thing that is made so and again so so like I said I don't have any particular fetish for Walmart. You know, it's just that 
I studied the company and have written a lot of papers about it, so we'll continue with that. We'll continue with that example. I think one of the reasons why Walmart is as big as it is is because of increasing increasing regulations in labor markets in certain places. So, one of the pathologies of regulation is that firms like Walmart can specialize, 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 and develop a comparative advantage in dealing with regulatory infrastructure. Okay, so Walmart's got an army of lawyers who can navigate all sorts of um, who can nav navigate regulatory infrastructure at the federal level, at state levels, at uh, in all sorts of other places. You know, mom and pop's grocery shop may not. Okay, so Wal so if Walmart can develop a competency in dealing with labor market regulations and dealing with product market regulations and things like that, then that should that should increase firm size. And again, I think that would be um, those of you again who are looking for dissertation topics. I think that would be that would be a good one. Okay. Great. So th that's that, that's an interesting point about why why large firms would would want to be regulated. And again, Professor Di Lorenzo talked uh, talked about this a, a little bit because so, Wal so Walmart gets a lot of criticism for being absolutely obsessed with profit. Okay. And so the reason why Walmart supported healthcare mandates, why Walmart supported um, an increase in the minimum wage, I'm pretty sure it's not because their executives woke up with a progressive social conscience one morning. It's like you know what we really ought to do. Is pay more and have have uh, have more of this wonderful stuff. So um, some of you might be familiar with the the phenomenon called it's called the Babist and bootleggers phenomenon. I, I, I don't know if, that, if that's been if that's been mentioned yet this week, but it's a, it's a term that was coined by Bruce Yandel to describe the coalition that supported prohibition. Okay, so the people who supported prohibition uh, the people who supported prohibition were quote the Baptists, so conservative evangelicals who thought that that alcohol was inherently evil. Or something to that effect, and thought you know, thou shalt not drink would would be a good law to have on the books because it would in, it would increase the uh, the moral quality of the people. Who else supported prohibition? The bootleggers. The bootleggers supported prohibition because they got rich. Okay, Al Capone was probably prohibition's biggest fan because he got fantastically wealthy running bootleg liquor into different places. So in this so in this kind of situation, the Baptists would be people who say, well, you know, it would be nice if poor people were richer. And I would love to see poor people get richher. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'd like to see everybody earn higher wages and have great stuff and all this, and all of this. The bootleggers in these kinds of situations are the firms that are going to be able to earn higher profits as a result of getting the, uh, getting the regulators on their side. Okay. Four. Ah, okay. What responsibility do firms have for negative externalities like carbon emissions? Okay, um, looking around the room, I don't see Walter Block. Okay, because <laughs> Walter, Walter actually gives a handful of great lectures on on uh, property rights and externalities. So I'm gonna I'm gonna punt to that and to my my lecture on uh, uh, environmental and resource economics that I'll give I think tomorrow, and just basically say if you transform someone else's property against their will or without without their their permission, then then they have a right to seek relief. Uh, so I hand here ish one two okay okay. Last question. Okay. 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 All right. I'll close. Okay. That, that's 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 a, that's a very good point, and I think it can be it can be summarized in one final claim that I that I will that I will close with. That's related both to environmental economics and to the theory of the firm. Okay. Um, so we're going to have cap and we're going to have cap and trade for carbon emissions and things like that. Um, a hypothesis that I've seen offered that I think is very very plausible is that this is going to work out to the explicit benefit. Of firms like Goldman Sachs and Exxon Mobil, things like that. That's a, that's 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 a prediction that I will make that I hope proves wrong, but we can talk about that in greater detail tomorrow.